Thank you all for coming. Uh, I have a number of folks I need to thank. I want to particularly thank my friends at Chevron. I want to particularly thank Joanna Nessif. Thank you, Joanna. I want to thank Joe Naylor for being here. Thank you, Joe. I want to thank Team Chevron. You know who you are. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, CSIS. I want to particularly thank Jenna Santoro, who's worked very, very hard. Thank you, Jenna. I'm very grateful. I want to thank Connor Savoy, um, who's a very gifted writer and a gifted leader and has been very helpful. Thank you, Connor. And I want to thank all of my colleagues who worked very, very hard to help make this happen. Um, this is the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. Uh, so this is, you know, international development has had a long trajectory. Uh, it's a moment of change and it's, there's, a, there's a lot of ferment. Um, so I think we're uh, having this conversation at a very interesting moment. Uh, I'm going to kick off the Global Development Forum with a visualization of the developing world. Aaron Milner, who's here, spent about a month of his life putting a lot of data into a data set. So thank you, Aaron Milner, for doing that. Uh, in the last 20 years, some countries have made measurable progress while others have stagnated. We did a paper on this called A Tale of Two Paths, and this is the visualization of this. Um, and to illustrate these divergent paths, we analyzed data across an array of indicators from economics, health, technology, stability, governance, and beyond 38 indicators. For a carefully selected 36 countries across the developing world, we measured progress over the last 20 years. Uh, we used data from the World Bank, the UN, the IMF, the ILO, NGOs, and other reputable sources. Uh, and the story we found will help us reframe and rethink how the US and the world thinks about development, but also thinks about how we might work with others and partner with others. I think we're going to need to rethink. Uh, this is not, my, my line is, this is not your grandparents' developing world. It's richer, freer, more capable, and we need to rethink how we engage, because the world that we are in is very different from 20, 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. Um, so to help us get from a one-size-fits-all approach to a more tailored understanding of the developing world, it's my pleasure to present to you a tale of two paths, divergence in development. This is not your grandparents' developing world. Today the world is freer, healthier, richer, and more capable than ever before. States once reliant on aid are now our trading partners and security allies. Others who received assistance are now donors themselves. But there are still a lot of challenges for the developing world. While some countries have improved beyond anyone's imagination, other previously evolving states have stagnated. These countries are fragile and need ongoing attention. We want to explore the divergent paths of the developing world and share one of the many stories that paint the modern picture of the global landscape. Through data and technology, we can visualize anomalies and overall trends in the developing world. We took data from the World Bank, UN, IMF, and other organizations and produced a numbers-driven landscape of the developing world. Today, we'll demonstrate the interplay of good governance, rule of law, and economic growth. The x-axis shows rule of law for a country. Countries on the right have a stronger legal and societal structure. And here we have regulatory quality. The higher you go, the better government can promote a strong business environment. In summary, bottom left bad, top right good. The size of the bubble represents GNI per capita, with larger bubbles indicating higher average income for individual citizens. We looked at 36 countries across income levels, upper middle income in red, middle income in green, and low income in blue. These four countries, Bolivia, Haiti, Albania, and Georgia, show the diverging paths of the developing world. In 1996, Bolivia showed strong rule of law and a good business regulatory environment, but you can see that it had a comparable GNI to the other countries. Albania, Georgia, and Haiti performed below average on the indicators. Let's see what happens over the next 20 years in these four countries. Remember that Georgia was still newly independent from Soviet rule in 1996, 
and was struggling with the transition to democracy and a free market economy in its first few years. 2004 protests led to the resignation of Edward Shevardnadze, who was president since 1995 in what became known as the Rose Revolution. After that, Georgia continued to implement free market reforms and transparent political expression under Mikhail Saakashvili. Despite occasional bumps, the Georgian economy has continued to grow. By 2015, Georgia outperforms China, Russia, Brazil, and many high-income countries in rule of law, business environment, and political voice. Albania is another former Soviet bloc country that has increased openness since 1995, contributing to stable growth. Their progress was tainted by accusations of corruption in their nascent multi-party and capitalist system. Albania's NATO membership in 2009 and its candidacy for EU accession in 2014 incentivized the country to reform and stay on the right path. On the other side is Bolivia. It performed relatively well in 1996 on the rule of law scale and at least as well as South Africa with its business regulatory environment. After continual improvements until 2003 under President Goñi Sánchez de Lozada, Bolivia descended into bad governance after the election of Evo Morales in 2005. Since then, Bolivia has regressed in part due to nationalistic interference in the economy and the judiciary. Over the 20-year period, Bolivia declined more than almost any country across regulatory environment and rule of law metrics. Its economic growth stagnated in comparison to other developing countries, especially Georgia. By 2015, Bolivia, once on a path to development and a rising middle-income country, is worse off than Honduras, Mali, and Pakistan by these metrics. Now let's finally turn to Haiti. It is an example of a country trapped by bad governance and weak rule of law that has enabled a cycle of poverty. The catastrophic 2010 earthquake destroyed infrastructure, sanitation, and health conditions. But Haiti had not demonstrated success even before the earthquake. Despite significant aid, Haiti has languished in underdevelopment. Here are the four divergent countries together. Countries like Georgia move from fragile to developed and stable, from aid to trade, in part thanks to improved laws, a better business environment, and a healthy multi-party democracy. Albania has succeeded in some regards, but it still has a ways to go. Countries like Bolivia took a different path and failed to deliver progress to its citizens. Haiti has not been able to escape poverty and underdevelopment. For the Georgias and Albanias of the world, we need new forms of cooperative relationships, moving from aid to trade, from development assistance to investment and partnership. For the Bolivias and Hades of the world, we need to ask ourselves, what role can the U.S. and other partners play in returning them to a path of prosperity? Now it's up to us to do something about what we see. Welcome to the 2017 Global Development Forum. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is John Hamry. I'm, I'm sorry you're sitting, seating in a kind of a funny way. You know, looking for you have to crank over, but we're going to drop some walls down for the breakout sessions, and that's why we're organized the way we are today. Uh, I want to say a sincere thanks to all of you for joining us. This is uh, really one of the most important things we do at CSIS. We started off as a defense think tank, uh, many people know, 50 years ago. But for the last 15 years, we've been focusing uh, with, it's, it's now our, larger than our defense work, on the so-called soft power uh, attributes of foreign policy. Development is at the top of that. The reason I mention it is that we're going through a bit of a debate in this town now. What is the future of development? And it's a lot of questioning going on within the administration, going on within the Congress. And it's going to be very important for all of us to play a role in making our voices heard about this. 
My, I come from a defense background. I'll tell you the last thing you want to do is to send in the military. You know, you want to deal with the problems before they get out of control rather than sending people in that have to bring order. And that's why development is so important to us at CSIS and why we wanted to champion this work uh, here at CSIS. I'm very grateful to have uh, Chevron as our partner. And I learned a lot by first working with Joe's predecessor, and we were talking about an experience that Chevron had when they went to Angola. And um, when they, typical oil company, they got an oil concession, and they met with the president and said, we'd like to give you a hospital or something. And he said, no, no, I, I don't want a hospital. I want you to help me build my economy. And um, he said, OK, you know, and how, how are we going to do that? Well, they, fortunately, we had a very good ambassador there at the time, uh, Don Steinberg. And they said, let's figure out how to do this. And Chevron went in the process of systematically looking how could they use the, the supply chain as a way to help the development of Angola. And it has been fabulous for business. Absentee rates are down. It's easy to hire. Vandalism has disappeared. You know, it, is, it has been great for business. And this was the important insight for me. And that is, there is um, we have a powerful resource in this, uh, in this country, which is the profit-seeking private sector, that's just as committed and dedicated to having safe and healthy communities to work in as the nonprofits like us. We need to harness this energy in to bring it into the development campaign, the development vocabulary. And that's what this was all about and why uh, Chevron decided we're willing to help bring this new focus to, uh, to the development debate in Washington, D.C. I'm very, very proud of that. I'm very grateful to you, Joe, and to, to Chevron. So let me turn to you, Joe, to say words of welcome and to get this off the ground, and then I'll come back just a minute later to introduce our keynote speaker. Joe Naylor, please. All right, well, good morning. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be out here today. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with all of you uh, around development. I, I want to thank John for, his, uh, for the partnership and the vision that he, uh, that he just articulated. Um, this is my first CSIS development forum, but uh, you know, I did talk with uh, my predecessor and I talked to a lot of my colleagues about this forum. And uh, I tell you, there's a lot of passion, a lot of excitement, and I think they told me how informative and how important this forum is. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be a very good conversation. Uh, we value the partnership that we have with CI CSIS. I think Chevron has had a partnership with CSIS for over two decades. And over the last six years, we've had a particular focus on the development side of this. So I think it's just an example of how we're continuing to grow this partnership. So you in the room, and I think many of our colleagues working internationally, uh, have done a tremendous amount of work in helping us understand development, uh, creating a more robust, active, and data-driven dialogue around development. Um, and you know, we're pleased to be part of that conversation. Um, we're part of the conversation. We at Chevron are part of the conversation because every day, you know, my colleagues and I are out uh, producing energy right, to help improve lives and power the world. And that's our business mission. So as we work towards that business mission, we're also advancing and enabling human progress. Um, we know through decades of experience that our business success is really deeply linked to society's progress. And we can't, uh, we can't see society's progress, we can't help society progress on our own. We need strong partners to be able to do that. So we work hand in hand with governments and NGOs to build the resources and human capacity uh, in the energy producing countries around the world. So we create jobs, we source from local suppliers, and we help develop uh, the, uh, the workforce, and we employ the local workforce. And actually, I'll talk about that on our panel a little bit later this morning. Uh, but importantly, we work with communities to identify the right strategic investments that they, are, they need, uh, including work on health, education, and economic development. So taken together, this is a symbol of our commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a business strategy that we believe has helped establish Chevron as a partner of choice 
in the communities uh, in which we operate around the world. It's a roadmap that continues to uh, enable positive and sustained generational change in those communities that need it most. However, we're keenly aware that community trust, sustainable development, and enduring progress won't be, uh, won't be achieved by acting alone. We do, need, uh, we do need strong partners. So again, we're working with governments, other companies, and civil society. We all have to work together in order to build the communities and create global prosperity. So the path we're on may be evolving, but our commitment to this shared vision, I think, is enduring. So with that said, I'm looking forward to working with all of you to achieve the vision, have a great conversation here around development, and see how we're going to be able to push development forward even that much further. So thanks very much, and I hope you have a very productive day. Uh, it's my pleasure now to, uh, oh, for, I screwed something up. I, I forgot to say, Dan Rundy, I need to thank you for uh, your leadership in this. He's the, by far the most creative person I've ever met in the world of development. I'm just very grateful to have you with us. Thank you, Dan. Um, uh, when America was confronting the great standoff after World War II, with what we now call the Cold War, um, I come from a defense background, but I'd have to say the strategy to succeed was not about defense. We needed to have a significantly s strong military to avoid intimidation, but the real strategy was to help other countries grow, prosper, develop, become strong, healthy economies. That's what the Marshall Plan was about. The Marshall Plan was far more important than the United States Army, and I'm deeply committed to our military. It was development that won the Cold War. It wasn't the military. So um, in launching this today, I wanted to bring in someone that is, I think, uh, has this very deep reflective intellect who's committed his life and dedicated his life to national security, but understands the power, the importance of the development agenda. Uh, Bill Fallon, uh, William Fallon, was Admiral, Vice Admiral of the Navy was the head of the Pacific Command, was the head of the Central Command, uh, and, and so he's a bona fide warrior, but he is also passionate about the importance of the development agenda for America's well-being and for that of our friends and neighbors and allies. So would you please welcome Bill Fallon. I'm delighted that he's here today. Thank you, Bill. All right, we're going to try an experiment. Does this work? Can you hear me in the back sleepers row? Good. Well, John, thank you very much for your kind introduction and your warm welcome and for inviting me to come here to speak this morning. Uh, back at uh, CSIS, it's really a pleasure to be invited back here and to have the opportunity to address uh, this important uh, symposium. Now, some of you uh, may wonder uh, why a craggy, crusty old admiral is up here uh, addressing this topic of development. And John has given you a little bit of a hint, but uh, on the way in, a couple of uh, people asked me what group I was looking for and uh, thought maybe I was lost, that I was uh, searching for the CSIS Global Security Forum. That was back in December, John? which I attended, uh, but uh, no, I'm here because I really believe that there are critical links between diplomacy and development and U.S. national security as well as the stability and security of uh, the whole world. Now, when I was younger, I uh, had a little bit more hair and it was a bit darker, and I can recall as a student at the Naval War College back in the 1970s, security was typically described in physical terms of territory and frontiers. It was primarily the business of state actors with defined borders in pursuit of hard national interest. However, over the years, while working on the ground in the far corners of the world and around the littorals of the seas, I came to, the, to appreciate that security is much more personal. 
And it starts with people in their day-to-day -day existence. It's fundamentally about individual security, you and me and, and the other billions of people in this world. The way people relate to one another, their families, their health, their jobs, their communities. The concept is broader and far more personal than the traditional notion of security that I grew up with. People the world over aspire to conditions of basic stability and predictability, good health, earning a decent living, raising a family, freedom from fear, abuse, and displacement. Needless to say, development in its many manifestations offers these possibilities. Notwithstanding my own personal enlightenment, a realistic assessment reveals that most efforts and resources in the world of international security are of the hard, physical, and military-oriented varieties. Now, someone who spent several decades in the implementation of national security and foreign policy, I recognize that military power and the resources which enable it are essential elements of national power. But military capability is only one of the elements of national power. Now, this conference is going to focus on the important roles that many aspects of development have in shaping our foreign policy and national security. Other vital contributing factors include the key tools of diplomacy, economic, financial, political elements, and certainly moral leadership. If you'll consider my contention that the idea of personal security and the aspiration for it at the individual level is, at the very least, an important aspect of national security, and likely an essential foundation of it, we have an apparent contradiction. Now, what is that? Well, policymakers and national security practitioners pretty much consider it axiomatic that security and stability are essential prerequisites to improvement in health, food, economic, financial conditions, or political development. Thus, it should come as no surprise that the major lines of effort in attempting to establish security will first be through hard power, so-called hard power, or military means, in order to set these enabling conditions for these soft, as they're called, or development aspects. Thus, if we embrace the conventional wisdom, it would seem to make little sense to expend development resources absent an already established security situation. In my opinion, absent ongoing open conflict, I can't accept this argument. My observation has been that at local levels, initiatives in things such as clean water, health, food, finance, education, basic security, and governance can and do make a difference in preventing the deterioration of conditions that lead to unrest and instability. Keys to success in these endeavors include long-term engagement and building indigenous capacity to sustain the efforts with local populations. The point is that we need to work in advance of crises. All too often, we're reacting to situations that have deteriorated to the point of agonizing, groping for solutions that many people are reluctant to take. We don't have to be there. If we work in advance, think about things, plan, strategize, and then implement in a coherent fashion, I truly believe we can prevent many of the crises that we end up and find ourselves in around this world. Governance is really critical. If you were to take a look at problem areas in the world, a significant number of them occur and continue to reoccur in areas where there's poor or absent governance and no rule of law. So these are really critical things that, in my opinion, we've got to work on. We end up resorting to military instruments because security conditions have deteriorated to the point that armed conflict has engulfed significant parts of the population or areas of the world and suffering becomes widespread. 
military intervention may well be justified or required. But the cost of addressing this, these situations is typically vast expenditures of human and financial resources and no small amount of opportunity cost. Consider an alternative scenario in which steady focus and attention is directed to the various aspects of de development as a preventive to preclude the deterioration of local health, economic, political, and yes, security conditions. It's likely that the relative cost of this option would be minuscule, but as we know, it's a tough sell politically. The reality is that crises tend to get people's attention, to get them energized, whereas small scale or nibbling issues just do not. My recommendation is to use all aspects of national power in the application of our foreign policy as appropriate to the conditions we encounter and that we want to improve preemptorily. The essential prerequisite, of course, is well thought out and effectively managed policies and implementation strategies. One challenge which I observed several years ago when we were working on a global health project here at CSIS was how to best integrate and coordinate the many national government, international, NGO, and private citizen initiatives. This is no small matter and requires an all-hands effort. Failure to work towards coherent and complementary solutions leaves the appearance, and all too often the reality, of disarray and wasted effort and undercuts the value of your efforts. In conclusion, as you proceed through your deliberations in the follow-on sessions today, let me challenge you to be resolute in forcefully making the case for development and to include demonstrable measures of effectiveness in every proposal. You, the experts, have the knowledge and the experience and you must make the case for what you believe. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, to kick off this effort, and I'd be happy to try to field any questions or comments or uh, ideas that you may want to raise at this time. Thank you. questions from the audience. If we, if we all agree, name, organization, and we promise to keep the question a question and a short question. How about that? Okay. So, my friend up here from ACI VOCA. Right. Yeah, here's, the mic here's the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Admiral, my name is Paul Gannett. I'm with ACDI VOCA. I wonder if you'd comment on the, the current situation in the Horn of Africa where there's famine in Somalia, Yemen, South Sudan, and the Boko Haram controlled areas of northern Nigeria. These are all, as you cited, places without governance, without security. The underlying good news, however, is that perennial famine Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, places where development has been building resilience and working, they're not having famine. Would you comment on the situation? So uh, these are uh, complex issues, and I am pretty familiar with some of the individual uh, nation states and their, their challenges. Um, most of the um, significant problems, in my opinion, are not caused by the weather, climate change, or other natural challenges, but they're man-made. They're caused by uh, poor planning, lack of it, greed, corruption, and other human failures. And uh, these are things that we have to continue to work on uh, step by step and, and so forth. And I think we have to resist, um, I'll, I'll give you an opinion, uh, South Sudan. Uh, I uh, understand the uh, tensions that were building uh, some years ago in the desire to uh, break off South Sudan from the larger uh, nation of Sudan and to create an independent entity. And uh, my instinct at the time was that this was not a good idea. But uh, my opinion was, uh, was not uh, attended to back here, and there were other issues going on at that time in, in my part of the world. And so we allowed this to happen, and 
you see it, uh, it's not improved, it's got, gotten worse. So uh, uh, there is no magic answer to this. I think that the uh, critical steps are to uh, have a willingness to get engaged and to stay there and attempt to work. None of these things are going to be changed overnight. It takes time, and that was uh, one of my key points. Recognize when that you get involved. Su that was the South Sudanese. Somebody's uh, <laughs> coming after me. And there were a few other examples I could give in the <laughs> last 30 years as well. So it takes uh, a willingness to roll up your sleeves and, and get there and stay there. And then uh, you, you've really got a, uh, got a clump of metrics and be able to transition this to the locals or we're wasting time. It's okay, just maybe. not going to be the, no matter how well intended, <clears throat> the do-gooder aspects of this are, unless you can get them inculcated into the local populations, it's their short term and going to go away. Yeah. Sir. Yes, uh, this is Lee Frozenberger speaking. I was uh, the Admiral's economic advisor at PACOM, and I just wanted people to know a lot of people talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. Uh, the Admiral walks the walk. He asked me to come with him to CENTCOM, and I'm glad you did, sir. But I must say, that position has been embattled at times because CENTCOM is a rapid deployment place. And uh, unlike PACOM, where there was always an economic advisor position, as you know, uh, trying to stand this up at a place like CENTCOM was not easy. But I just wanted to, to ask you any thoughts about your decision to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, Leif, uh, let me, I'm not sure what the question was, but let me go back to, uh, <laughs> let me uh, acknowledge uh, Leif is a, a terrific help to me in Pacific Command, and I, I think I'm not unlike a lot, of, a lot of people in the world, you, you get to go to places, meet new people, and uh, there's so many things going on. How do, you, how do you get up to speed? How do you find out what's happening? How do you get hard data that can inform good decisions as opposed to just pick one? And uh, this man uh, was immensely helpful, and for his good work, I drug him over to CENTCOM, uh, which had two major wars in progress and not a lot of interest in long-term planning. It was reactive. So anyway, uh, Lee, thanks for Thank what you. you've done to help uh, this country and people around the world. Maybe we could take one more question. Andrew yes, Mack, or oh, this one back here, sorry. So sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Admiral. I'm Monica Kerrigan. I'm with Japigo and NGO, and I was, had the good fortune to be at USAID during the time of the tsunami in Indonesia. That was very unfortunate, but I thought our military came in and did a great job helping their government and delivering uh, logistics and supplies and working together in great partnership. And I was wondering why that doesn't happen more often um, and why we shouldn't use uh, more of the technology, science, and logistics of the US government to help countries and in those partnerships. Thank you. Okay, well that's a very interesting topic and I'm going to digress a little bit from, uh, from your question because I think it, uh, it's illustrative of the possibilities in this world. So uh, the event uh, to which uh, you refer, the 2004 tsunami, was a, a, uh, a very, very significant disaster for that part of the Indian Ocean's uh, southwest, uh, Southeast Asia world. Um, and uh, people responded as, uh, as best they could. The US military has a very robust logistics capability. And uh, the main business is not uh, humanitarian relief, it's, uh, it's other things. But uh, we have this capability and few others do. And so uh, when, uh, when a crisis presents itself, we do everything we can to try to make these uh, tools available and to facilitate Thanks. other organizations to, to do well. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people pitched in and did a lot of good work. Uh, I think the question you were asking is why we don't uh, maybe have a bigger, more robust capability to do this. And again, the answer is because our main business is in other things, uh, which is why we need whole of government efforts, uh, particularly in the thinking and planning and strategizing of how to approach what are certainly going to be more challenges in the world and to get these activities moving from uh, places that I think are probably more appropriate than the military. But we'll continue to do what, what we can. But since you raised this point, I want to uh, use this as a bit of a teaching point if I could. 
So uh, at the time of that, that natural disaster, you may recall that uh, the province of Aceh was in turmoil in Western Indonesia. Do we have any representatives from Indonesia here at the conference today? Um, at that time, there was an open insurgency uh, in progress. And uh, just to put this in uh, geographic perspective, Indonesia is a vast country that's uh, broader across east-west than the United States, uh, covers, covers a lot of territory, many millions of people. So uh, this ongoing conflict uh, was in progress and this disaster occurs. And uh, I can tell you that there were a number of uh, decision-making points that were pretty interesting. One was, should the U.S. government actually commit our military to do anything ashore in that situation, given the uh, un instability and the likelihood of, perceived le likelihood of uh, conflict, just going to the, attempting to rescue people. A decision was made, and I think wisely, to uh, let's go give it a shot. At the same time, within Indonesia, it was an interesting dynamic. So you had uh, significant uh, government uh, military presence out in that province uh, battling the rebels. And when this occurred, uh, there was uh, some hesitation, It's probably the best way to put it on the part of the Indonesian military, about just how to address it, what to do. Um, and uh, the leader of Indonesia at the time, uh, Mr. Yudhoyono, former military commander, told them to get to work and address the humanitarian issue. Don't worry about the military crisis. Take care of the immediate needs of the people right now. And they did. And I suspect that uh, in the minds of some of the rebels, uh, this was seen as a potentially golden opportunity to make hay while other people are busy. Uh, for whatever reason, that didn't occur. And over the ensuing months, uh, the reality that uh, from this disaster, people pitched in together uh, to work to alleviate the suffering, motivated an effort to attempt to resolve that crisis and that ongoing insurgency in Aceh. And it was successful. And some uh, unlikely partners uh, that came together to facilitate that. And I would highlight the EU for one and uh, the uh, government of Thailand, who had representatives that negotiated a settlement that, uh, that ended up uh, resolving the, the situation and uh, set the foundation for a potential uh, much better future. So I haven't been out in, uh, on, in that province in uh, probably a decade now. I'm curious. I'd like to go back and see. Hopefully, they're continuing to improve. But uh, there are opportunities that come up all the time around the world. And the key thing is, uh, can we make the right decisions and do the right thing, motivated by a desire uh, to, to help people? And uh, this audience and this gathering uh, has within your knowledge and capacity an ability to put in place the tools that, that could be very useful in addressing these situations. So with that, I'll get off the stage, let you get to work. It's been a pleasure to be with you this morning, and all the best as you carry Thanks, out. Admiral. We've got a plenary panel. I'm going to ask the plenary panelists to come on up. Okay. So we're um, Kathy. We're going to be talking about workforce development as a strategic approach to economic growth in the developing world. I don't think. I suspect this audience is aware there is a global skills gap. This isn't just a global problem. This is a American problem. A number of people have educated me on this. My friend Bill Reese, who's here from the International Youth Foundation, my friend Aaron Williams at RTI, um, have talked about the, the youth bulge and the critical need for workforce development. And I think it has all sorts of drivers for national security. For our national security as the United States, it has all sorts of implications for, um, for our prosperity as well. Um, it has implications for things like the global refugee crisis. We did a major report on the Northern Triangle 
uh, in Central America. And one of our deep thoughts was that if you could increase formal economic growth and get people into jobs in countries that people would want, you know, young people are going to use their kinetic energy for something. They're going to use it for good stuff or they're going to use it for <laughs> bad stuff. And so our job is to try and make sure they use it for good stuff. And so um, the additional thing we need to understand is even with the current rates of growth in Africa over the next 15 to 20 years, there's going to be a massive number of young people in Africa, some as large maybe as 450 million, I think is the number, uh, of people who are not going to have jobs in Africa. So whatever the global refugee crisis is, and we're not, we're not going to spend a lot of time necessarily, I think it's going to be out there today, whatever's happening now is going to look like a garden party compared to what could be coming. So this, this conversation is directly relevant to that among other, some of the other challenges that we face in the world. So that's why I wanted to have this as the plenary. The final point I want to make is something my friend Don Terry has said for a long time. He used to run the Multilateral Investment Fund at the, at, um, at the Inter-American Development Bank. The best social program in the world is a job. And I don't think that was original thinking on his part, but it, I always thought he, he always said it, so I give him credit for it. So with that, we have a fabulous plenary panel. We have some really thoughtful people uh, to help us unpack this that requires education, it requires uh, government, it requires society, as, as my friend Tansri Nauru will tell us, and it also requires the private sector. And it also requires, frankly, a growing economy. We want to have a growing economy, we want to grow as fast as possible. So we've got some really thoughtful people. I'm very grateful you have their bios in front of you. Let me just briefly recognize them. My friend, Tansri, Dr. Narul Ainur Maud, who's the Secretary General of Malaysia's Ministry of Higher Education, has flown in from Malaysia to be with us. Thank you, Dr. Narul, thank you so much. Um, Mary Snap, who's the Corporate Vice President for Microsoft Philanthropies, thank you so much for being here. Joe Naylor, who you heard from earlier, who's with us, um, uh, who is with us from Chevron, who's the Vice President of Policy, Government, and Public Affairs at Chevron. And then we have Dr. Kathy Watecki. Thank you, Kathy, for being here. She's the former undersecretary at USDA. She's also the former chief scientist at Mars. Uh, you didn't bring any chocolate <laughs> bars, did you? Right. But, the and, but then you <laughs> also, though, were the, form, the other reason we were so enthused to have you is that you are the former dean of Iowa, Iowa State's College of Agriculture in Ames, Iowa. So thank you for being here. So, okay, so let's, let's get started um, uh, with that. So, uh, Dr. Nurul, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Malaysia has had a phenomenal run it, for 7, 8% from 1970 to 2000, year over year growth. Since then, it's had year over year growth. You're upper middle income country now. Yeah. Your prime minister said that Malaysia will not fall into the middle income country mm -hmm. trap, which many of the people in this room understand. The reason I wanted to have Malaysia on the stage is Malaysia is the country that others are going to follow over the next 15 years and many of the things that Malaysia has done. So thanks for being here. How are you thinking about workforce development in terms of how you're going to prepare for, for the, your future economy? Well, uh, the first place I would say that uh, the leaders of Malaysia, the prime minister and also the cabinet ministers are very committed towards uh, workforce development in the nation. And uh, in this regard too, we have plans, strategies to ensure that uh, our people, especially the young people, they will not be jobless at the end of the day. And that's the reason why in of higher education, for example, we have this tagline of education for self-employment. And we build, up, uh, we build up a confidence in our students. And also by the fact that uh, entrepreneurship is one of the biggest agenda of the nation to ensure that you know, when you talk about multinational companies, them investing into Malaysia and also getting FDIs, the students, they need to know the business acumen of people, of the, the private sector. And in this regard, this is where the Prime Minister himself stressed again and again that no ecosystem in Malaysia is going to have development without quadruple helix model. And what well, is the quadruple helix well, model? Early on, it was only three players. You're talking about uh, the public sector, the private sector, plus academia. But now we are involving the NGO and also community. So that's the quadruple helix model, whereby the planning, the implementation, and even the execution of everything that's being done at the planning uh, at the uh, ecosystem is actually being done and also being uh, how to say ownership ownership of this quadruple helix model. 
So that's my take on uh, development in Malaysia per se and how we move fast. So Dr. General, how do, comp how do companies, whether they're multinational corporations or local, there's some very fine local Malaysian companies I had the chance to meet several months ago uh, when I was in Kuala Lumpur. How do they communicate what their workforce needs are? Do they call you up? How do they, how do they communicate that? And uh, this is where the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, for example, they have uh, dialogue dialogue uh, partners, uh, they are dialogue partners with the pub private sector and we have meetings, we talk to each other and uh, in this regard to, for example, M uh, Ministry of uh, Higher Education, we bring in the multinational companies into Ministry of Higher Education, for example, Huawei, they are investing in our ministries. That's the Chinese technology the Chinese, company. Yeah, the Chinese technology company, uh, they are investing in our, in our universities, we have Torrey from Japan, we have uh, Microsoft, we are going to have it uh, soon, very soon. And, I was uh, hoping you were going to mention American <laughs> company at some point, so I'm really glad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was you, getting nervous. <laughs> yeah, Microsoft is coming to Malaysia. Okay. I, we are going to have this collaboration together. So this That's why you're sitting next to each other. Exactly. Right. We are, I'm trying to lobby her. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we are actually having this strong partnership with all the multinational companies. The, we were talking, when I, when I was in Malaysia, you, you have a series of sectors that, you, that are going to help you break the middle income trap. You, you see you have, you have a strong agriculture sector, you have oil and gas, yeah. which are important components of building blocks of your economy, uh -huh. but you also have moved to a service economy and a knowledge economy, and that's a big part of your responsibility, and I'm sure that's why Microsoft is going to be signing an agreement shortly <laughs> in Malaysia. Yeah. But what you talk, when I was there, I was struck by there were a series of new industries that are going to power your economy beyond an upper middle income economy to a developed economy. What are some of those and what are the kinds of skills you're going to, your folks are going to need, your people are going to need to help you get there? Well, I think everyone here in the ro this room is familiar with fourth industrial revolution. Fourth industrial revolution. Exactly. So we are preparing for that, for the fourth industrial uh, revolution, the advanced materials, nanotechnology. This is where we know that uh, step, STEM per se, Science, technology, uh, engineering, engineering and, math. and mathematics will play a big role in the context of Malaysia. And in fact, the Prime Minister himself is the chairman of the National Science Council that was established about two years ago. So it's a national priority if the president of your country has made it, a he's big the agenda. chair. Right, because for us to move out from this uh, middle income trap, that's the only way for us to go, that's going through STEM. Okay. So let me just ask one other question, which is, I think too much in this country, in the United States, there was an overweighting towards people getting PhDs or, or even college degrees degrees and that that was a social signaling device and I think it's a great thing I'm, I'm certainly a product of that myself but but it seems to me that that we have underplayed vocational technical training or folks who aren't necessarily going to go get a PhD in engineering so there must be millions of people in Malaysia who aren't going to be PhDs in engineers and who aren't necessarily going to be inventing the next nanotechnology robot thing whatever right. you know so how are, how are you, how, are you, how is Malaysia, which is one of the largest investors in Asia in tertiary education, 1.5% of your gross national income is spent on tertiary education. It's higher than Singapore and higher than South Korea. So what are you spending that money on for the folks who aren't going to get a PhD in engineering, if I can put it that way? Well, uh, that is one area now we are, we are focusing on. That is TVET. What TVET? is TVET? TVET technical vocational education okay. training. Okay. So we know that the investors who only come to Malaysia, we have the, the, the workers that are experts in uh, the technical part of it. And this is where TVET becomes a huge agenda with regard to the 11th Malaysia plan. And in the context of this, Malaysia, that is a um, sort of higher education, for example, we are setting up to ensure that the economic growth of the nation will be drive by the TVET players or the TVET students. And we're build up, building up our polytechnics, uh, vocational schools, and to ensure that, um, you know, those, especially those on below bottom 50 population, no, in the context of Malaysia, for example, we go for capital economy, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we are looking into people's economy. We want to ensure that the bottom 50, 40 of the people, they are taken care of. This is where the TVET players come into picture and we bring them along in the context of the nation's uh, economic growth, the future economic growth, and also in regard to the fourth industrial revolution. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nero. Thank, thank you, you so much. Mary, thank you for being here. My I'm pleasure. so glad we have you next to each other. So maybe we can sign the MOU <laughs> yeah, here. Okay. This is great. <laughs> we'll so, do that later. So I'll do a quick review since I'm the former lawyer. Uh, right, okay. she's the, exactly, exactly. So, so Mary, thank you for being with us. I am uh, really grateful that you're here. And 
I, when I think about Microsoft, um, you know, I, one of the questions we had in our, in our conversation last week was, where's, the, where's the, your growth going to come from for your company? Is it going to come from the United States? Is it going to come from emerging markets? Where's your future growth going to come from? Yeah, I, I actually think it's going to come from everywhere. So in, in, in the old world, um, in the world of software, we were expanding internationally. Obviously, we're in about 190 countries around the world in terms of um, a sales presence. But in a world of cloud-based computing, you're really talking about an innovation that is to the next level, the fourth industrial revolution. And every company and every business person, essentially, we hope, will work in the cloud. So the growth will absolutely come from emerging markets, but we also hope that we are essentially have a renaissance and a regrowth, a birth in the cloud for companies that are industrialized and for young people who want to be entrepreneurs as well. But, but uh, it is fair to say, so everywhere is, is, I agree with, but it, the fact that you're signing agreements in Malaysia says to me a big party, a bigger part of your growth in the future is going to be emerging markets. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say, absolutely. The, um, the, in terms of the, when you hire somebody, what are the kinds of skills you look for? Well, we, um, as you know, we, are, um, we have a, a lot of need for engineers, but as you go forward to think about you know, this new age of information, a lot of the skills that we hire for today will be sort of need to be refreshed in five to seven years. So basic, obviously, the need to do math and algebra for our engineers and some basic notions of critical thinking uh, computational thinking, learning to think a little bit like a computer so that you can actually train the computer. Those kinds of adaptive skills are going to be absolutely critical as, as actually, I'd say they're characteristics. The skills will change every five to seven years in the age of innovation. That is a really, that's a very sobering statement. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what it sounds to me like we're going to need people who are adaptable and flexible. Absolutely. So in terms of, do you, I know that some of your peer competitors, and I, know, I believe you do this too, will certify people. You don't get a, a, a PhD in, in Microsoft, but right. do, are you, do you have globally a Microsoft certified standard for technical folks? So not a PhD in engineering, but someone who can, re, I don't know what you'd call it, repair black boxes or, you know, or fix the cloud. I don't know how you fix the cloud, but, yeah. but, but I think you know what I'm trying to say. For, for non-tech people, <laughs> you got to have I'm Microsoft certified. So what does Microsoft certified mean for you? And I, and I think, and I mean for non-PhD engineer people, yeah. what does that mean? I, well, I think there's, you know, today there's a, a group of certifications that we offer kind of on a worldwide basis um, in, an organ in a, a category that we call Imagine Academy. And those would be things related to productivity software, but also somehow the fix the cloud kinds of things. So I wasn't there. wrong, fix the you cloud, not, right? You were okay. not wrong about that. We, call it something a little bit different. Okay. Right? Uh, I like fix the cloud. Yeah, but I, but I will also that. say that you know, we, we are so happy to have acquired LinkedIn in the last few months. And LinkedIn Learning offers thousands of courses, some of which have certifications. So we have a variety of certifications. We have programs that are not necessarily certified that start from the very beginning of how to do an hour of code for a 10-year-old all the way up to certification um, um, programs. So if I'm in Mali, I could get certified? Uh, yes, you could. You could, you could. If I was um, in Malaysia, I could get certified. Absolutely. If I'm in Minnesota, I could get certified. Absolutely. I will also tell you that if you are in Austin, Texas, you can take a class on drone licensing that we're From working Microsoft. on. Uh, that we are partnering with Rice University and others mm -hmm. in providing. So we have a variety of different kinds of That's licensing wild. and certifications. Yeah, see, I think this is, goes back to this issue, the fourth industrial revolution. So Dr. Naru was talking about the fourth industrial revolution. So um, I wrote a blog in Foreign Policy about the fourth industrial revolution. So things like AI, yeah. 3D printing, drones, yes, driverless yes. cars, right. big data, yeah. new forms of energy. Right. Um, nanotechnologies, advanced materials, advanced manufacturing. So, okay, so just on this drone thing. So, what is it, if I want to go to Austin, Texas, what is it? Is it a two-week course? Is it a six-week course? And do I come out of it? How do I show people I have a drone 
Do I have a drone license? What is that? Well, it's, it's really interesting. This stuff is all developing. I think it's about, in this case, it's about a three-month class. It's uh, geared towards high school students who are doing it's it great. outside of their formal education. Uh, there is a certificate, but there are, there are lots of licenses being developed now for drones, to tell you the truth. Uh, pretty much all around the world. But I'd love to tell you, if I could, just Please. a really quick story. Please. I met a young man the other day, just, just an example of things that might happen. I met a young man the other day who started a company in the United States. He's from Arkansas. He's 14 years old. <laughs> he saw a young girl with a prosthetic arm that cost $80,000 to buy and would have to be replaced every several years oh. as she grew. He invented a prosthetic arm with a 3D printer that costs a thousand dollars that operates off of a sensor. And I love it. that's the kind of entrepreneurship that we need to right. see all around the world. So that, that, that's that could the happen in Arkansas, gonna, uh, that can happen yes, in Kuala could. Lumpur, yeah, it could. that can yeah. happen in Bamako. Human com, human potential is unlimited and as long as that's, you're enabling it, right? So it's that's all phenomenal. about basic math. And education, some of it will flexibility, be flexibility, adaptability. It's not going to yep. be. It may not be a bachelor's degree or may PhD. It may be a six-week course. It may be. It may be. We'll still need those college grads. Oh yeah. We'll still. But there will be a range of opportunities. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for being here. Ninety-three percent of your workforce are folks from your local community. I understand. And you train local people. You hire. You develop skills and capabilities. Some of those folks then go on and take that and bring that to either their uh, the, to other parts of the other companies. Hopefully, they stay at Chevron, of course. Of but course. Um, you also, what I really like about Chevron is that you also have these global supply chains. Um, you, in 2015, spent nearly 800 million dollars on goods and services from women and minority-owned businesses in the United States, and more than two billion on goods and services from U.S.-based small businesses. But I think that is you could just copy paste that around the world in a series of developing countries as well. I mean, you guys are a great force of good in the world. Um, so could you talk about, you need all sorts of skills for a, a global energy company to be successful. So could you talk a little bit about that? And also, could you talk about STEM education in particular? Because mm -hmm. I think um, there's, a, there's a link to STEM education and, and energy. So yeah. thanks for being here. Well, let me, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with, um, uh, we, we do some of the skill development through these uh, through partnerships. And let me, let me start in yes, that sir. area. Um, so you're absolutely right. We need a skilled workforce. But ultimately, you know, when we go into a country, we're typically there for generations. You know, um, and so when we think about uh, what is the com uh, how are we going to be successful, and this goes back to my opening remarks, we're successful if the, if the community within which we operate is successful. And so we work with the local community to try and identify their needs. And a lot of the needs are around uh, education and uh, uh, workforce development. And so, for example, we'll do partnerships um, involving local government, community leaders. I, didn't, I hadn't heard of the Ford Helix, but I, I like that, <laughs> I like that uh, concept. Because I think we do, I think we have each Introduced of those by Malaysia. helices that, that, uh, that we're using there. Um, but we have. You can I'll, trademark I'll, I'll, that, Dr. Yeah, Merrill. It's exactly. excellent. I trademark it. Exactly. I'll, I'll go through three examples here. One uh, that we uh, just uh, up the road here in Appalachia. You know, so we have a lot of uh, uh, coal miners that have been out of work. And while we're not in the coal mining business, we're operating in that area because there's a, I have obviously a big renaissance in energy in the uh, Appalachia region. And so we're involved with other partners there in helping retrain coal miners to be able to compete for jobs in the growing energy sector and the advanced manufacturing sector. In uh, Thailand, a lot of uh, activity in STEM education there. And uh, we've set up, uh, again, through local partners, uh, 18 different training hubs around Thailand to uh, get students more enthused about pursuing STEM education. Kazakhstan, we have a pretty significant presence in Kazakhstan, and we're working with the Society of Petroleum Engineers as well as the World Economic Forum in developing a petroleum engineering curriculum in the local universities such that they can essentially home grow their own engineers to work in the energy sector. That's great. The, could you talk about the, some of the, the, you have these really interesting partnerships. Could you talk just a little bit more about vocational technical training? Because a lot of the folks 
that work for Chevron, not only are they very advanced engineers and some of the smartest scientists in the world, but just like a lot of other industries, you've got folks who are not necessarily going to be PhD engineers. Tell me about how you think about training or capacity building for them, and, and, or how do you create a, a cadre of folks that when you come to a community, you refer to a little bit in Appalachia, for example, but I know you have to set up, I, I'm thinking of, I think in Indonesia, I think this is true, I think this is true in Kazakhstan, I'm sure it's in others. You have a, an approach to building a, a capacity of your, of your people. Yeah, and, tip, and it, we do, but I think it's, we think about our workforce, but I think we think more broadly, what is a, again, what does a community need? And so um, we will, uh, try and address the specific needs of the community there for workforce development. And in maybe one example in Nigeria, you know, so obviously they, they need economic development, they need the education, but they also need peace in the Niger Delta in particular, right? So we have um, a partnership, the Niger Delta partnership, for example, that one component of which is to help uh, stabilize the community, essentially. And so once you have that stability, then you can really focus on how can you get the economic development underway. Um, in terms of the workforce development uh, for local communities, again, it's, it's sort of specific to the needs of, uh, of those communities. So whether it's in the San Francisco Bay Area or... Uh, in, You're the largest uh, it, employer in the San Francisco Bay Area. In California, yeah. Right. Yeah. You're the largest so, private employer in California. No yeah, one, people yeah. don't know that, but that's yeah. that's the case, right? Yeah. 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 But we're and so for education. Everyone thinks for it's example, Google, but it's not. It's you guys, right? But but so for. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So for for but but in education, for example, um, we have uh, we've invested about three hundred million dollars over the last three or four years in various educational programs around the world. So you know we, we really try and put money behind this, and uh, it's developing you know teacher training, uh, program for students, um, it's yeah activities really to try and with a primary focus on the STEM education. So you can't engineer your way out of every problem. And you can't, as an energy company, or as a tech company, or as an agriculture food company. So could you talk a little bit about soft skills? We were talking a little bit about this yeah. in the green room. So what are the kinds of soft skills you need or you're gonna, you need from your workforce? We've talked a little bit about adaptability and flexibility. That seems to me that's going to be, we're all going to have to, I don't like change, and I'm sure other people don't either. But, but what are some of the soft skills you look for or need for, for people to succeed at Chevron? Yeah, well, we are a company, I would say, by and large, a company of engineers and scientists. And so that's, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our employees, that's how they've come into the organization. Uh, I would say one of the areas that uh, universities have not traditionally been phenomenal at is teaching communication skills. So you're very good in technical skills, but uh, you really need to be able to develop in, uh, your communication skills. And so being able to communicate is a very important skill, but I think equally being able to work internationally. For a company like Chevron, where three quarters of our operations are outside the United States, you need to be able to work in different cultures. And so adaptability, both in terms of flexibility to work environment, but also adaptability to work in different cultures is a very important skill. For a company Do you have like to work ours. in teams? Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think there's you just can't work by yourself in a cube and just solve a problem. At Chevron, I'm guessing no. Uh, I, you're, you're guessing correctly. Okay, no. I'm just guessing. Okay, I'm guessing in most industries it's that way. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, thank you, yeah. Kathy. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I'm very grateful that you're here. Um, the we talked about you. Your last most recent job, you were an undersecretary at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You've had a really interesting career. Um, we've got, we're going to have 9.5 billion people in the world. We're going to have to feed them all. Uh, and it's probably going to require technology. And it's probably going to need, require agricultural productivity. That's what folks like my friend Joanna Nesseth have told me because she started the food security program here. And I said, okay, I agree with that. So what are we going to need? And the, Ameri the United States has been a global agriculture power. How, I'm assuming we're going to need a lot of science and technology to remain a global agriculture power. And is it, you know, maybe it's a little counter to it, but are we going to need, is there going to be more science and technology and agriculture in places like Africa and in places we hadn't thought about before? Are we going to need science and technology and how are we going to do that? Without question, we're going to need more science and technology throughout the world as it applies to, to agriculture. Um, there is a, a report that comes out each October as part of the events at the World Food Prize and uh, it's produced by a group called the Global Harvest Initiative. 
and they're projecting to mid-century what the global food gap is going to be. They've developed a gap index. And uh, projected from now to the year 2050, we're going to have to have an increase in agricultural productivity worldwide of about 1.75%. Uh, in the developed world, we're pretty much on track. In the developing world, that increase at currently is only at 1.3%. So if you compound that over the next 30 to 35 years, there's going to be a huge gap in food uh, as projected by, by uh, some economists that I have some pretty good faith in. Um, that increase in agricultural productivity is not going to come from bringing more land into production. It's not going to come from throwing more resources at it, more fertilizer, more mechanization. It's going to come from scientific innovation and from the know-how that farmers have in order to apply that information. So, Yes, we're going to need more research. We're going to need more tech that gets transferred to farmers. And we're going to need well-educated farmers who know, know how to take advantage of that. So yeah, technology and education are key. Could we, I was shocked. You told me there's a brain drain in American agriculture. Could you just spend a minute on that, what you meant by that? Yeah, about 18 months ago, uh, Purdue University, along with uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture at USDA, uh, published a, a study that says annually in the United States, we're producing about 58,000 graduates with bachelor's degrees in the agricultural sciences. So agronomy, entomology, animal science, plant pathology, the traditional agricultural disciplines. 58,000 new jobs are required in those areas. The, the number of graduates is that, that we're producing year? per year is 35,000. <sighs> so we've got in the United States, just in those agricultural disciplines, a gap of 22,000 <clears throat> roughly graduates per year. And around the world, um, it's pretty much the same. The agricultural disciplines um, have been somewhat in eclipse in our universities, although in recent years, with the interest in sustainability uh, and also with this latest generation currently in college and, and renewed interest in food issues, um, a lot of the universities are starting to see an increase in enrollment in the traditional agricultural areas. So I, I'm going to ask a little bit of a, of a, of a cheeky question, but the, the, you, you, can, you, can have a, you can be pretty rich and pretty prosperous as a farmer, right? I mean, isn't that part of what we've got to be selling here a little bit is to say it's not, it's a, you can have a great life. Uh, in agriculture. Is that, a, is that a fair statement? Well, using the U.S. example, yes. Um, farmers' income is actually above the average uh, in, in the United States. Um, and that's largely because they've been very good at adopting yeah. new, new technologies. Um, but that's not the situation around the world. Uh, and in fact, as this audience is well aware, in the developing world, Many, many farmers are subsistence farmers with less than a hectare, so you know one, maybe two acres of land, um, and it's a very hard life for them. So what kind of, so we talked about science and technology, and we're going to need it not just in the U.S., but in places like Africa. What are the kinds of training that's going to be necessary to get the sort of increased productivity not, not everyone's going to be an agricultural scientist. Not everyone's going to do a breakthrough drought-resistant seed. But for folks who are, who are tilling a one, two, or three plot acre plot of land in Africa, what are the kinds of either training they're going to need, and what are the kinds of science and technology breakthroughs that we're going to see that that are going to be you know that that are going to happen over the next five to ten years? What do you what do you think? Well, uh, you know, certainly in the developing world, the, the kinds of agricultural systems that are in place are so varied, and they go from the very small holder to very large mechanized farming operations. So, so the kind of skill sets are, are very broad. Um, to reach the, the, the subsistence farmer, um, 
One of the techniques that has been proven over the last 20, 25 years to be very effective are farmer field schools, where um, frequently university-based, sometimes government-based experts train the trainers who go into local communities and work directly with farmers on transferring knowledge directly applicable to the agricultural This is not a PhD have. program, is that this correct? This is mm -hmm. not a PhD program. This is really very much farmer driven, the problems that they're having and what kind of information do they need to address those problems. Is it like a two day workshop? What is this thing? Well, the farmer field schools usually go on over periods of months um, with the, uh, again, the trained, the trainer coming into the community, sometimes working with uh, an individual selected by the farmers in that region to train that individual who then imparts that knowledge to the other farmers. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a, a program that takes place to develop um, knowledge in that local community and again usually goes on over a, mm -hmm. a growing season um, sometimes multiple years returning with, to address specific issues so our universities not just in the u.s you were dean of the college of agriculture at iowa state in ames but not just in the united states but in malaysia or in south africa or indonesia uh, uh, or Ukraine, what are the kinds of changes that formal universities are going to have to make for this new world? What are the kinds of skills they're going to have to teach in this new world in, just for agriculture? Well, some of the skills that we've been talking about already, certainly the fundamental knowledge and science and technology as it relates to agriculture, um, how to take advantage of the new technologies. So Drones. some of the work that Microsoft hmm. has been doing on encouraging applications using knowledge from many different fields. These apps are being developed uh, using open data and sometimes proprietary data to deliver solutions to farmers through smartphones in developing countries. So. So that's There's a coming. Whole wide array of skills and knowledge um, that already are being deployed, but also provide a lot more opportunities in this. So future. we're going to have to have people be able to learn how to make. I don't know how you. What do you call it? Make an app? Is that what you say? I don't know. Make an app in Africa, because just sort of the example that Mary was using of there are going to be some really creative person in Congo, who's going to figure out an app that's going to be applicable to at Congo, Congolese agriculture. It's but they'll need happening. a cloud. And they're going to need a cloud, and they need to fix the cloud, <laughs> yeah. and make sure the cloud is fixed <laughs> yeah. for that and to work. And it's already <laughs> happening. Mm -hmm. and it's already, this is already happening. Yep. So are we going to have drones in agriculture in Africa in five years' time? Uh, is it already there? Or yeah. there? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. OK. Thank, OK, so here's my question for the three of you with, for Dr. Narul. So Dr. Narul is charged with helping break Malaysia out of upper middle income to rich. So in each of your cases, if you put, Kathy, if you put your old Mars hat back on and Joe, operate as if there is oil and gas and there is an opportunity. And Mary, you are already in the process of signing something in Malaysia. So what are the kinds of, what are the kinds of skills if you are going to invest in Malaysia as a multinational company, what are the kinds of human resource capacities you would have, ne you would have needed or do need for you to make, there's a whole series of other uh, assumptions, but what are some of the base, what are some human resource assumptions you need? Because that is one of the basic ingredients for a company say, I'm gonna invest in a country. So let me start with you, Kathy. What would be some of the things if you put your old chief scientist back, hat back on? Well, there are 13 agricultural universities in Malaysia. I love it. And um, since we've Good. got a public-private theme running through this conference uh, and entrepreneurship. Right. I think one of the things that uh, you could consider doing is with those 13 universities incorporating a agriculture entrepreneurship initiative uh, within the universities. Um, drawing on the private sector partners uh, in the local areas around those universities uh, and uh, so anyway, that's, that's one idea on moving forward. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Joe? I'm, yep. not, I'm not allowed to answer. You, I'm going to have you respond. 
after that. So, but Joe, what would you, let's assume there's oil and gas in the ground. There is. Right. There, there is. is. There's plenty. There is. <laughs> so I think with Malaysia, it's actually, you know, Malaysia is pretty far along in terms of workforce development and, uh, and the like. So I think that, you know, I think it's just continuing on that path. Um, you know, from an oil and gas company, we are looking for, you know, folks that have that STEM education. And I know there's a lot of people within Malaysia that are going through both primary, secondary, and tertiary education in the STEM field. So that's, those are obviously important uh, to work for an oil, oil and gas company or an en energy company. Um, but then also, you know, some of the, uh, some of the stuff that, uh, that Mary has talked about, a lot of, a lot of the work that uh, we're doing now is really uh, analyzing big data, right? Whether it's seismic information, or drilling information. So having, you know, sort of cutting edge knowledge on data analytics and uh, big data uh, manipulation is uh, another critical skill to be successful in the energy field. So Mary, why did you sign an agreement in Malaysia? Well, I actually would love to learn a little bit more about that. I, I, would, I will tell you, though, I actually was in Kuala Lumpur in the June time frame uh -huh. and visiting our Microsoft sales office, um, among other things. So okay. learned a little bit about Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur in particular. Um, we operate YouthSpark and other programs there in an after-school setting, but I think the most important thing for us um, and actually there's room in the United States to work on this hmm. too, is to ensure that in the basic educational systems, we have young people doing math and algebra, mm -hmm. which are the basics for you know, beginning that logical thinking that can apply in you know, not only the science fields, but actually in the liberal arts fields. It's the same sort of computational thinking. So if we could have a compulsory model in which math and science and algebra is required up through some of those levels, that really sets us up for all kinds of growth in a, on a going forward basis. I'm gonna tell my 13 year old this because he gives us all sorts of trouble about this. So we're gonna just yes. say, I talked to Microsoft and they said, you gotta do this. You gotta do <laughs> some algebra, you have yes. to. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Narul, so I, I'd love to get your reaction to this, but I also want you to, the following, I, okay, so if I get a PhD in engineering in Malaysia, What's, how, how, are, how am I, what soft skills am I learning as part of the curriculum, in addition to English? And I want you to talk about English, but I want you to tell me about how, how are you, what other soft skills are you teaching? Because it's, it's clear to me that we're needed, gonna need adaptability, flexibility, work in teams. So how are you incorporating that into these highly technical uh, pedagogies, or, you know, or curriculum, so I put that. Okay, Okay, Dr. first Nurul. can I answer to yes, please. Uh, uh, Catherine? Yeah, you talk about uh, entrepreneurship, for example, in the case of Malaysia, all our 20 universities, the public universities, we have center of entrepreneurship. So in other words, even, uh, even in agriculture, the students are encouraged to take agriculture when they graduate. So in fact, we are giving uh, allocations or rather funding for them to start their business and also for them to move on from there. And we are making it agriculture as a vogue as a work job, in the sense that, you know, it's not a dirty job, you know, it's a, it has to be respected by the people. At one time, true enough that uh, our students, there was a decrease of uh, students uh, majoring in agriculture, but now it's moving up mm -hmm. slowly because the government plays, basically in anything we do, the commitment of the government is very important. And in this regard, we are making it as a work job and to be, uh, that, that, can be uh, that can be employed and also to be uh, uh, taken up by the young people especially. Mm -hmm. That's to your question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, Taylor, uh, you talk about STEM education. Uh, true enough that um, we are into BDA, IOT, and, and you, you're talking about uh, fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this regard too, for example, I have to give an example whereby uh, the fishermen in Malaysia, we are so vogue. We are utilizing apps for us to go uh, outside uh, to catch fish. So the folks and in the fishing industry are using apps. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They are utilizing remote sensing. In other words, for example, the fishermen, they, they have a, 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 how do you say it, an association, yes. and they build up apps, and this is whereby- They're making their own apps. Yeah, and of course, with the assistance of the remote sensing of Malaysia agency. Right. For example, if they were to go out uh, into the sea, they can identify 
the fishes without you know without having to go from one place to another place because the remote sensing from the satellite can zoom in on the fish and they can go straight away and in fact that can one I bring one to the Chesapeake Bay because I like sure. fishing yeah. this is great definitely I can, I can bring can you we bring yes this? sure it's like north south cooperation this is great right yeah <laughs> let's have that kind of cooperation in the future and uh, uh, that's for 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 you know STEM education but however I must stress that uh, in the in the case of Malaysia for example is the ratio is still 60 40 mm. 60 mm. arts 40 we are moving towards we are ensuring that it moves to uh, 60 40 for science STEM mm. and 40 for, uh, for, for arts uh, ne next is uh, okay my next part my partner my future partner Microsoft <laughs> uh, yeah we do we are talking in fact I chaired the meeting with Microsoft on data analytics uh, true enough you were talking about certification just certification now. we want certification for our students for our Ministry of Higher Education students so that they will be much more employable and yeah. in fact we are paying to ensure that our students get the certification they go out there in the market they have the certificate oh Microsoft you know uh, I undertake uh, this course from uh, my Microsoft and they will be employable so that's how serious Malaysian government is when it comes to ensure that uh, capacity building of our Ministry of Higher Education or rather the university students. So does every, st let me ask you just uh, some soft skill questions, Dr. Nurul. So does every student in Malaysia, do they have to study English now? Yeah, uh, at one point, I have, I have to admit that at one point, uh, it used to be English during my time, and then we changed to uh, Malay language or Bahasa Malaysia, but now we are moving towards uh, English again. Reason being, again, you're talking about FDI and the soft skills, you know, the flexibility of students. They need to communicate uh, at multinational level, uh, you know, officers or even the, the, the subordinates. This is where the English is very important and it has been stressed by the Prime Minister himself that it's not only English, we are talking about Chinese. You're, recently he was back in China, exactly, they are learning Chinese and we came back, the Prime Minister came back from uh, India, now we are going to Tamil. Really? Really. <laughs> so we are you are talking about multiple Quatrilingual. languages. Exactly. Quatrilingual. Quatrilingual. So that's how we have to work. So, but Dr. Nero, how so if I'm a PhD engineering student or I'm getting I'm in the agri one of the thirteen agricultural schools in Malaysia, tell me about the other soft skills in addition to English. Do you have something where the, as the as the Secretary General for Higher Education, do you look at the curriculums and say, Where's the teamwork? Where's the where's the creative thinking? How are you getting that sort of things into the curriculum? Okay. Now you're not talking about conventional learning, flexibility and experiential learning. So we have a program, we started uh, late last year, it's called 2U2I. Two years in university, two years in, with the industry. So all students are now attached to U2I. So they have the experience of working. So it's like an internship or an apprenticeship? Exactly, for two years. Okay. <clears throat> That's for that. And besides that, uh, we have CGPA. In the case of uh, the developed economies, you know, I, I studied in the US before. You are looking at the performance in terms of the uh, education, academic, right. But in the case of Malaysia now, we call ICGPA. So whereby you are talking about the soft skills. They are volunteerism, they are entrepreneurship. And you talk about entrepreneurship subject. It is compulsory for all students in, in the higher education in Malaysia to take three credit hours of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship training. Entrepreneurship training. See, I, I think, Dr. Nero, I think that in many parts of the developed world, entrepreneurship is sort of a self-actualization exercise. I think in much of the developing world, it's a necessity. There is not going to be necessarily enough jobs in multinational corporations. There's not going to be enough jobs in the SME sector. We're going to have to have many young people start their own businesses. So I think you're absolutely right. This is not a lifestyle choice. This right. is a necessity in the developing world. So education I think it's very for smart. Education for self-employment. Education for small employment. All right. Let me let me just go back to the panel that I want to open up. I want to just use the word internship or apprenticeship and ask the three corporate folks, just given that Dr. Nurul has raised this, when I say that, what, what is your reaction to that in terms of what's your reaction to that term? Um, may I ask, can I start? Yes. Um, I, I think it is an area where we all need to learn a lot more and to reinvest. So very recently, we actually made a trip to Switzerland and spent a day and a half learning about the apprenticeship program there, which is a real partnership with the schools and private industry and government to provide uh, apprenticeship opportunities for students in that 15-year-old uh, range going forward. This has been something that has developed over time in, um, 
in the United States, labor unions, and it, but in other, but in the formal education system, it has kind of withered in the last, you know, I'd say 15 years. And they're still teaching woodworking classes, which is a good thing, but not really getting you to where you need to be. So I think reinvesting in apprenticeship uh, throughout the world, actually Including even in the, in the United US. States, yeah. mm -hmm. is a, a very important thing. Okay, so Joe, when I say the word internship or apprenticeship, what is your response so to that? Internship is, that, that's something we do, you know, that's sort of normal course of business. We'll bring in folks, you know, typically you know, college students, uh, whether it's in the sciences, engineering, even in the public affairs or government affairs type of area. We'll, we'll bring them in for a summer and serve sort of a... Is undergrad a, and graduate? Uh, both, yeah, but typically undergrad. Is, so, but, but, I, but let me just yes, sir. build on the, uh, the apprenticeship, I think, that Mary was talking about. I think that, and this is you know, part of the focus of some of these partnership initiatives I was talking about earlier is developing those vocational skills because within, within the United States, one thing we're very short of are, thing, are things like welders, machinists, mechanics, great paying jobs. <laughs> that you can teach these skills and we are in dire need of these skills. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah. If I could, I, I, no, sorry. I was actually talking to someone yeah. else in the manufacturing industry recently and they told me that they really needed to develop mechatronics. And I said, What's what that? is that? Yeah. Yeah. And they said- It's fixing it's, the cloud. No, it's actually a little bit different. It's teaching, it's essentially fixing the robots and maintaining yeah. the robots yeah. in yeah. an yeah. autonomous uh, right. automated situation. Yeah. So yeah. while the actual manual labor may be disrupted and that job may be disrupted, there will be a need for people who know how to maintain and fix robots. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so Kathy, if you put on your old chief scientist hat at Mars or your, your dean of the college at Ames, at Iowa State University at Ames, if I say the word internship or apprenticeship, what's your reaction to that? Well, for internships, from the university perspective, we were looking to place our students in opportunities where they could uh, develop their skill sets, decide whether this was an area in which they would want to pursue a career. So, and from the apprenticeship, it was more towards the um, vocational um, training. And I, I might note that in agriculture, there's a resurgence of apprenticeships. Hmm. Um, as the average age of the farmer in the U.S. is approaching 60, um, we're looking at a, a turnover in ownership of, of land in the U.S. That, that's going to be huge. And uh, some farmers are finding that their family doesn't want to continue in the tradition. And so they are setting up apprenticeships to bring in young people who want to take over the farm and developing new models for how that um, ownership is, is going to be. It's like over. taking so over a veterinary practice or a dental practice, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's like yes, that. Yeah. So, okay, so let me just ask. Uh, so uh, we've talked a little bit about the fourth industrial revolution. So. I think this is an issue that, so robots, these other things. I, so one of the questions I think we want to do a lot more work on here at, at CSIS is, what happens if traditional pathways out of poverty, say, let's say there have been hundreds of millions of people who have gotten into the first rung through things like textile manufacturing, Central America, South Asia. What if those go away because of robots? Or what happens today, here in the United States, the largest employer of white males between the ages of 20 and 60 is, is truck driving. So what happens if 15 years from now we have driverless trucks? So um, that's coming. We just had a, I think it's fair to say, a disruptive uh, election in the United States in November. So what happens if all those folks are out of a job? And so just, you know, you can do the math or you can, you can, you can connect the dots. So what happens if, if you, all the textile jobs in South Asia go away? Or let's say all the manufacturing in China goes away to robots. Or let's say it's driverless cars. So, so my question is, should people be freaking out about the fourth industrial revolution? Should people be afraid? Is this, a, is, this a, is, this, is this time different than the second industrial revolution or the third industrial revolution? What is that, you know, I think this is a big question. I think it's a little, little bit to be unseen. Let me start with you, Kathy. Well, I don't think we're at the freak out stage okay. uh, yet, uh, but I, I do think it's enormously important that we start considering this very seriously. Um, and I can take it down to the personal Please. level. A friend of ours' um, daughter is married to a trucker, and her dad, who works in the IT industry, 
is trying to convince him to think about other areas where he would like to be working because of the, just the point that you made. So it's time to start having these conversations. It's time to start planning. Um, and mm. I, I think it's going to take not, uh, you know, it's going to take a whole of industry, whole of academia, mm. whole of government approach towards conceptualizing the pathways and the policies that we need to be thinking about to face what is going to be a big transition. So, Kathy, this isn't just an American challenge, it's a global challenge. Yeah. Right? So, okay, so let me, I mean, Joe, I'm going to skip over you because I want to, I want to, Mary and I had this conversation about Fourth Industrial Revolution. I just want to, so, Mary, so should people be panicking about the Fourth Industrial Revolution? I would say people should be planning, and we're in the midst already <laughs> of it. Um, we talked about um, skills and characteristics that people will need to have. I think people will need to learn to be continuous learners for sure, and will need to put programs in place like certifications and other kinds of things. But I'd love to actually suggest one other thing that I think large tech companies could help with, and again, really happy to have the, uh, the uh, LinkedIn as part of us. We would love to see a world in the future where we could essentially, using data analytics, map the skills of people and map programs to acquire new skills and map available jobs so that people, skills, and jobs can find each other. And there are these kinds of economic graph models being developed in pilot places. And we would love to see more technology engaged so that we can not only provide skills, but actually link skills, jobs, and people. Yeah. Can, okay, can so I make one comment? Yes, sir. Yes, I, I, I guess I just see this as much more of an opportunity than a, than a threat. And mm -hmm. if I think about, you know, in the developing world, if, I, if you can get a 3D printer to print a replacement part mm -hmm. uh, for something that's broken rather than have to, you know, ship it, you know, halfway around the world, the productivity of that farmer or that, that you know, that uh, individual has just increased dramatically. So I, I think there will be, there's clearly disruption, there's always disruption. But I'd see it much more as an opportunity than a threat. Yeah. So are you Good seeing point. in the energy business, I'm, I'm just going to just listen to 3D printing, yeah. drones, driverless vehicles. I mean, are you starting to see that in just in your, your industry? Yeah, and I think the uh, yes, yes, and yes. I think, uh, um, and then also, I think probably the biggest for us is in the data science area. You know, we are a data company. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, the, the volume of data that we process is probably larger than just about any other industry. And really? So, I had no idea. Uh, data science is extremely important to us. So big data matters to, to Chevron. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so Dr. Narul, so when I was in Kuala Lumpur six months ago or several months ago, I, I got the sense that Malaysia is, is not freaking out about the fourth industrial revolution, that Malaysia is embracing and trying to adapt and get ready for the fourth industrial revolution. So is, it, is that a fair assessment of how you're thinking about it? How are you think, when you think, you, you've done a lot of thinking about the fourth industrial revolution, how is Malaysia preparing for the fourth industrial revolution? But uh, you know, we cannot avoid from fourth industrial revolution. It's Everyone coming. Is into, it's, it's already there. We are into it now. So this is where I think that what was mentioned by Klaus Schwab, that uh, you know, during the World Economic Forum, there should be a mystery of future. It should be happening to all countries whereby we need to predict the future. And also in terms of foresight, uh, technologies looking into it. And you know, like we mentioned by Mary just now, we should be prepared, not really afraid, but we have to do the planning now. And this is where foresight comes into picture. And the mystery of future, you know, it might happen to all the, the other countries. Yeah, you might have I, to think about yeah, it. Sorry. sorry. If I could, the, some of the reports, McKinsey and others are saying that this particular revolution compared to the others, will happen about 10 times faster and 100 times the scale, just because of the Oh, that's reassuring. Yeah. So there is some planning that needs to, you know, we're, we're like active, we need to be active here. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so let me just close with the following. I, I'd like, so if the president of the World Bank was sitting here, the president of the Asian Development Bank will be here, at, at, I think one phase. so if the president of the Asian Development Bank was here, and he'll be here in a little bit, and so we're thinking about workforce development or we're thinking about skills. Is there something that an institution like the Asian Development Bank or the U.S. government in its capacity at USAID, is there something the president of the world, what, what could 
various other actors, we've had a very interesting conversation. Is there some one thing, if you had sort of your five minutes with the president of the Asian Development Bank or the head of the World Bank, what would you say, given the conversation we just had about workforce development, training, curriculum, flexibility, getting ready for this major change and this youth bulge, what would be sort of that one thing? Let me start with you, Dr. Nero, because you were at the World Bank in a, in a past life. Yeah, I was in the World Bank before. And uh, I would say that Asia Development Bank uh, director is coming today? The president, yeah. The president, okay, good. Uh, in other words, we must use multilateral platform. We need to collaborate. In the case of uh, ASEAN, the Asian part of the world, Southeast Asian uh, specifically, we have ASEAN. ASEAN is a strong uh, The platform. ASEAN, yeah, platform yeah. is a good we one. We have 10, 10 member countries. Yes. And in fact, we have meetings after meetings and, and meetings where we really coordinate, we cooperate, we collaborate, and we implement things together. And we have that joint strategy and infrastructure, for example. Exactly. That's very influential. Right. And it's very influential. And this is where that, uh, for example, last week I was in Jakarta. I was uh, having a meeting on Ministry of Higher Education, and this is where we coordinate among ourselves. For example, we are looking into mobility of students, uh, harmonization of issues, agenda, and it works because you are talking about 50 million population in, in the South Asian group, uh, group okay. in Asia, and it's going to be the power. Amazing, great. Yeah. Ma Mary, if you were, what would you say? Uh, very quickly, I, and without, you know, um, at the risk of sort of changing the topic entirely, I would say one of the most important things is to enable governments and industry to work together to actually manage the flow of data, the storage of data, and when and how data can be released to government actors. And this will be absolutely important. The cloud and data will be the backbone. Fix the cloud. Of, no, not no, fix the not. cloud. <laughs> Ensure Protect that the, the cloud, cloud is protected <laughs> and secure yeah. across governments. But I actually think, Mary, that's a good point because the aid business, whether it's the World Bank or even, you know, if you look at the UN stuff that's out there, they'll say development is a catalyst. It's not the central player. So part of its job ought to be to be the glue money for multi, multilateral collaboration or to get business and, and education educators to talk together or to talk better together. Yeah. So on point, so it's good. Okay, Joe? I'll fully agree with Mary in terms of protecting the cloud, but I'll, I'll also build on that. I mean, I think that it's, um, yeah, I, I would say uh, we've had great success with the partnerships that we've had. You've mentioned USAID. We've had a number of projects with USAID and NGOs and local community. And I think that you know, whether it's Asian Development Bank or USAID, we got to keep doing this. This is, I, yeah, I go back to the comments that John Henry made at the beginning. This is really effective, uh, much more effective than a lot of other stuff that we could do. And uh, so we just need to continue doing what we're doing. Okay, great, thanks. Kathy? Um, I would say invest in agricultural research that's done at universities. Because when you invest at the university, you're getting research that's focusing on problems of that country, of that area research that is also contributing to education, undergraduate and graduate, that builds capacity within country, uh, and also that has those spillovers to helping the farmers um, address the problems that they're facing. Great. Okay, this was great. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the panel.